we're the Alamo. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Jason Richards. Uh, my name is John Rewark. Welcome to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly hangout where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open to the public and on the level. Tonight, uh, we have a, a short crew, starting with me. I'm John Rework, past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia, where I'm currently the junior warden. I hand it off to Jason Richards for his introduction. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jason Richards, and I am the senior warden of Acacia Lodge number 16 in good old Clifton, Virginia. Thank you, Jason. Juan Sepulveda. Hello, everybody. Juan Sepulveda here from sunny Kissimmee, Florida, member of Orange Blossom Lodge number 80, and the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry podcast. And last but not least tonight, one of the brothers, Johnson, Robert. Hey, everybody. Uh, Robert Johnson, um, hailing from Waukegan Lodge, uh, past master there, current secretary, and host of Wince KMU Masonic Podcast. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. The Masonic News have been light this week, so we just want to reiterate something that I'm sure you're sick of hearing about by now, which is this upcoming March, that is March 19th, the five of us, even Nick, will be at the Academy of Masonic Knowledge, which is a Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania-sponsored event, where uh, we will be at the Masonic Village at Elizabethtown, PA. If you're interested in coming on by and seeing us, it comes at a low, low cost of uh, you showing up and maybe chipping in 10 bucks for lunch. But you do have to register in advance. Go to pamasons.org slash academy and send an email to the AMK secretary at pagrandlodge.org. Do they have a do not have to be a Mason. Oh, yeah, you don't have to be a Mason. That's awesome. Yeah. Open to anybody. We're going to live stream as much of it as we possibly can. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun stuff there, too. We'll have uh, merchandise and whatnot. I'm going to bring my TMR stamper, so if you want to get a Masonic Roundtable stamp in your Masonic passport, if your jurisdiction does that sort of thing, hit me up. Uh, we're also going to have a little bit of a get-together after the symposium Saturday night at the hotel. I like, really quick, I like how you said that if your jurisdiction does that kind of thing, like with a passport, uh, they sell them everywhere. But I could almost I could almost see some grumpy past master going, Passport? I don't like clan, it. That's clandestine. <laughs> But they didn't do those in my year. You you can't stamp a passport with a lodge seal. That's for dues cards only. That's kind of what happened, which is why I gave that caveat. That's for official <laughs> communications only. But oh. if you bring something to us, we will stamp the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, I have to act like I have suspenders. Looky here, boy. Looky here. <laughs> yeah, so it's going to be a, a busy couple months um, for right. us. So John and I are going to be speaking at uh, Andre Bellivo's Lodge uh, District Symposium up in New York in April, April 30th, I believe. And then I will be the opening act for Mark Tabert at the 5th Annual not Evening of Masonic Light up in Nashua, New Hampshire um, in June. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So PA, uh, New York, Massachusetts, uh, the whole northeast. New Hampshire coast. is not in Massachusetts. What did I say? What, oh yes, New Hampshire. My apologies. Yes. Anyway, we've got we've got the Upper East Coast covered, and that's not counting like RJ, who yes. goes and speaks in a different state every single week. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be awesome. So Californians, step up your game. I might be I might be pushing west to California in September. Nice. nice. Yeah, so it's still we're still working it, but yeah. And, and for the brothers that are listening, if if you want to bring some uh, some programs to your jurisdiction, uh, either of us, if you have any any particular events that you want us to attend, just reach out to us. 
at Gmail, right? The Masonic, the Masonic Roundtable, Roundtable at gmail.com. Yeah, we're happy to to come anywhere. If you're if you're far away, um, it's going to be difficult for us to travel without funding for travel. But last time I checked, we weren't uh, we weren't asking for honorariums, so that's something. <laughs> it's a good thing. We don't we don't, yes. we, know, we don't decline them either. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Money. Nice. Okay, do we have a Masonic Monday question? On Tuesday, no we don't. That's right, unfortunately. Womp, womp. As, as you can see, Nick is not with us tonight. He's been under the weather, he's been busy moving into a new house, so his duties have dropped. So uh, we will not have a Masonic Monday question on Tuesday. We thought about asking the same one from last week to see who noticed, <laughs> but uh, yeah. We weren't going to be that mean. So hopefully, uh, we'll have a short episode tonight because uh, there's really there's there could be lots of lots to say or just enough concise to put into one podcast. So we're going to go with the latter with tonight's topic, which is remember the Alamo. This is a show listener requested topic, uh, and the listener was my mentee, Al Leathers. Uh, who I brought through the degrees in masonry, who is celebrating his first Masonic birthday today. Today. Happy first birthday, Alan Leathers. So uh, congrats. And happy, happy birthday. It, it happened to a line because From this all is... of us to you. Yes. <laughs> Are you going to finish this song? No. Okay, good. Uh, you don't get cake, I'm sorry. The cake is a lie. <laughs> oh, it's not a comic book reference. All right, so so Al Leathers wanted to hear about the Masons at the Alamo, and we thought it was apropos to schedule this event on the somewhere between the the time of the battle and since today lines up uh, February twenty third, twenty sixteen, with the anniversary of the beginning of the Battle of the Alamo. Let's get into it. Um, so I'm going to give a brief synopsis. I'm not going to try and read off a script, but I'm going to piece together uh, things. So for, for those San Antonio Masons listening, I'm sorry in advance for screwing up your history. <laughs> uh, but the Battle of the Alamo occurred between February 23rd and March 6th, 1836, and was a pivotal, pivotal event in the uh, Texas Revolution. Uh, what was interesting, what was going on at the time was, again, Texas was still a, a republic and it was still floating around uh, the border of uh, Mexico. And <laughs> Robert's got a nice picture. Keep calm. There's no basement at the Alamo. <laughs> what, what's, what's that referring to? It's from Pee Wee Herman. <gasps> Oh, wow. See, there's a reference that was almost <laughs> lost on me. We're not cool enough. Wow. Uh, Pee Herman. Yes. New movie, March 18th. That's true. And cue it up in your Netflix now. Okay. Robert, back, you're going to scare our listeners away. Back to the Alamo. Um, so what was going on was that uh, there was a, a battle of territory um, between the Texans and the Mexicans. And... Uh, in the, the winter, like say December uh, of 1835, um, that the Texans had driven all the Mexican troops out of Mexican Texas. And so about 100 Texans were kind of stationed at the Alamo, which was an old church that was established in the 1700s uh, as, a, as a missionary kind of church. And uh, unfortunately, due to its location with all these crossroads uh, between cities and towns, it actually had a lot of skirmishes that, that um, occurred there, so it really never got to fulfill its, its, its uh, sacred purpose uh, a whole lot throughout its, its history of being. Um, so about 100 Texan troops were stationed there just to kind of keep uh, set on an outpost. Well, on February 23rd, approximately 1,500 Mexicans uh, marched into the area about a couple blocks away um, as a first step in a campaign to retake Texas. Uh, again, there's only about 100 guys 
uh, station there, and there's 1,500 Mexicans knocking at the door. Uh, so um, they kicked off a skirmish on February 23rd, and they were able to hold their own, which is amazing. So they, they kind of got a little bit of vin vinegar in their blood and got proud of themselves. They called for reinforcements. The Mexicans called for reinforcements. And uh, the size of the Texan, Texan uh, unit kind of grew from about 100 to about up to 180, 190, depending on, on the total count. Uh, meanwhile, the, uh, the Mexicans also got some backup, and uh, they said that probably could have been up to 2,000 Mexicans um, by the end of the battle. Um, a couple of little skirmishes occurred over the next couple of days, and by um, the mo early morning hours of March 6th, the Mexican army advanced on the Alamo. Um, again, the Alamo held back two attacks, but on the 3rd, uh, the Mexicans conquered, scaled the walls, and basically slaughtered everyone there. So out of the 180, 190 Texans stationed at the Alamo, all of them died in the battle. And so it was a Mexican victory um, that uh, took over took over the Alamo. Um, historically, yeah, three, it's... Three reportedly surrendered, three according three. to some... According to some. Tales. Yes, and we can go into some of that. Um, but because of the bravery of the men there and the letters that went out as they sent for backup, that they were not going to surrender, they were going to stand their ground, they, um, they are remembered as a brave troop that fought to the end, never give up, never surrender, uh, and were able to, um, to die with dignity defending the cause of liberty. Uh, the official end of the battle, uh, or not the Battle of the Alamo, but uh, a couple weeks later, um, the, Tex the Texans defeated the Mexican army at the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21st, 1836, ending that revolution. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Battle of San Jacinto in a little bit. So why are we talking about it here on a Masonic podcast? Well, we, uh, we know of at least six confirmed Master Masons that fought in the Battle of Alamo, and we're going to go a little bit into the history of each uh, each of these brothers to the best of our ability, and uh, figure out kind of who they were and what they fought for. Uh, the uh, the ones that we will cover tonight include James Bonham, James Bowie, Davy Crockett, William Barrett Travis, and even from the Mexican side, Santa Ana. So who wants to go first? And James Bonham. And that was the first one. So uh, because of that, your error, your mistake, you go first. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to open it up with William Barrett Travis. <laughs> you jerk. <laughs> what? Why not James Bonham? Because Juan's doing James Bonham. Oh, I got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, Juan's first. Well, we, be, before we, we went live, we were talking a little bit about some of these uh, these brothers and, and some of the characteristics that they had. Um, and something that goes, uh, a thread that goes through their personal life and what actually is remembered from the Alamo is that tenacity and that, that, that fire in, in their hearts to, to fight for what, for what they believed. And Bonham is a great example of this. We were talking about a curious fact that when he was in, in college, he was the organizer of a protest. Um, and everybody in, in, that, uh, in that group got expelled from the, from, from the school, which I thought was a, a very interesting point. Um, and as he continued going through different places, he was in South Carolina, um, you can see that he was not just someone who would take a stand for what he believed, but he had that contagious spirit, and he got other people to join him in the effort and actually take uh, take action. Uh, another example was 
there's an account of him actually brandishing his his weapons, including a, a sword and a pistol, against Andrew Jackson. Uh, this was uh, back during the uh, a confrontation in, in in South Carolina against the the federal government. And Andrew Jackson, for those of you who might not caught up, he was a brother. So here we can see some, hmm. uh, yeah, we can see some. I want to say sanguine, but I'm not sure if, if if it's right in this context. But you can see that 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 fire that he has enough to uh, really confront uh, other people for something that he felt was unjust. Uh, Bonham was also uh, paying close attention to what was happening in in Texas. And in 1835, he, he wrote a letter to Sam Houston, who eventually became very yeah. uh, – he, he admired – they mutually admired each other uh, for what they stood and how they went about to, to do it. But what I found curious was that he believed so much in this cause that he offered himself to Sam Houston without any expectation of compensation. He was willing to – uh, not accept any payment for this. He just wanted to go and volunteer and lend, basically and ultimately, his his life for the cause, mm -hmm. which he did. So he was there. He died at the Alamo. There's still some discussion of how he died. Some people believe that he was manning a cannon at the time, but it's still something that you know, hundreds of years later, we're still uh, trying to figure out. Now, Sam Houston was also a brother. So yes, yes, Illuminati confirmed <laughs> that all these key players have uh, all been involved, and so much, in fact, that both President Andrew Jackson and Sam Houston were members of the same exact Masonic Lodge, Cumberland Lodge Number 8 in Nashville, Tennessee. Look at that. That's amazing. That's what I have for for Mr. Bonham. All right. Thank you, Juan. You're welcome. J Jason, let's cover James Bowie. All right, Jim Bowie, uh, who is probably uh, the second most famous uh, of the Freemasons that fought at the Alamo outside of Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. Um, Jim Bowie was born in 1796. He was actually... Uh, a good 10 or so years older than the other Master Masons about whom we're talking today. Um, he is actually one of the most popular characters in the Old Southwest. Um, born in, in Kentucky, uh, lived along the bayous of Louisiana, and uh, gained a reputation as an alligator rider, Indian fighter, and deadly duelist. And uh, you've probably heard of something called the Bowie Knife, which was named after uh, Jim Bowie. He, uh, he joined the 2nd Division Consolidated in the War of 1812 and fought against the British. And after that war ended, um, he actually engaged in, in slave trading uh, quite a bit before moving over to Texas. Um, the interesting thing about Jim Bowie was he was, he was very well-traveled, and uh, he was a man of, of social affluence, but he was a bit of a shyster at the same time. He was a con artist who consistently lived in debt. Um, and uh, when he came to Texas in 1830, he became a Mexican citizen and settled in An San Antonio. San Antonio, excuse me. Um, where he got married to uh, the daughter of one of the vice uh, governors there and tried to attach himself to the aristocracy. It's interesting, there are uh, reports th out there that say he, uh, he valued his estate, or he was able to marry this woman because he valued his estate at something like $220,000, and his estate really was valued at like less than $30,000. Um, to the point where he had to, you know, he had to borrow money for the honeymoon, um, and that was just kind of the the kind of person he was. He was just fierce and had a lot of tenacity, and just kind of flew by the seat of his pants. Um, very passionate. Uh, unfortunately, 
Uh, three years later, three years later in 1833, his wife and two children died from cholera, and that's really when um, Jim Bowie started to focus the majority of his his attention on the burgeoning Texas Mexican hostilities. So he uh, he spent a good amount of time um, in the struggle for Texan independence. He's Outside of the Alamo, he's most known for um, working through the siege of Bexar. Um, and on February 2nd, he, he wrote that, uh, you know, he was in the Alamo, they were dug in, and uh, he said, we will rather die in these ditches than, than give up. Of course, we know how that ended. Interestingly enough, Jim Bowie uh, fell ill uh, during the Battle of the Alamo. So on 23 February... Um, he fell ill with, with what at the time was called pneumonia. Historians now believe it was actually advanced stage tuberculosis. And um, he, uh, he basically sat out the, the Battle of the Alamo on his cot, um, fighting from his cot, actually. Uh, so once, uh, once the Mexicans came in and identified the body, they, they saw that... Uh, you know, Jim Bowie had been shot several times in the head, and uh, that is uh, that's essentially what I've got on on Jim Bowie. There there are a bunch of different stories throughout his life of him dueling and gambling, and he he just kind of rode this uh, this high and loose lifestyle um, and fought with a passion for what he believed in. And that's kind of what, what got him in and out of trouble for, for his entire life. So he's a very interesting character. Thanks, Jason. The next famous Mason here is Davy, Davy Crockett. Robert, <laughs> tell us about Dave Crockett. Davey. Wow, Davy Crockett, man. Dude was uh, certainly considered a, a legend in his own time. Uh, as a young age, he was basically uh, indentured, a servant sold off by his parents to basically pay debts. Uh, something along the lines of his dad owing like $36, uh, which was quite a hefty sum back in those days. Um, shortly after that, uh, he was really involved in, uh, well, of course, he was a frontiersman, so all the things that go along with that, making him... Uh, an incredible individual, you know, basically at the height of his popularity were during the 1900s when Walt Disney uh, immortalized the image of Davy Crockett as this larger-than-life figure. Um, but what's interesting is he, out of all of the people that I hear about with the Alamo and you hear a lot of wild and crazy things that go on uh, with these gentlemen, things that pull you in different directions, like, wow, they were a mason, that must mean they were really great people. But then you learn that they had these dark sides as well. And what's... I didn't find, you know, everybody has some dark stuff, but uh, Davy Crockett really was on the better side of history for a lot of things. Uh, of course, he and uh, Jackson did not get along at all. He really despised Jackson. Um, a lot of people did. Uh, Crockett's biggest thing against Jackson at the time was there was an act that was passed to basically take um, sovereign land from uh, Native Americans to, and, and to move them. It was the Relocation Act. And Crockett was infuriated that the government wanted to take the uh, natural people of the land and move them off uh, so that they could use it. Um, in his legislative careers, uh, both um, in the uh, House of Representatives and in the uh, Tennessee General Assembly, he really fought for uh, people's right to maintain their land, um, mostly poor folks. He was super... Uh, as much as you could be for people who didn't have much, uh, he was always a support for those folks. Uh, he lived in Washington, D.C. Um, when the House of Representatives lived in barracks, basically, in D.C., while um, 
House of Representatives was in session, uh, kind of a far cry from where House of Representatives, uh, those representatives live today in mansions. <laughs> um, but what's really cool is just his um, consistent um, nature in that he always made remarks about how he would never, ever, ever uh, go back on what he said. He didn't want to die uh, with regret. So he always felt he had to do the moral thing and to look around stuff. But also the counterside to a lot of you know what you find about Davy Crockett is that he fought for all this land and he fought for the little guy and he did this and that and the other. Um, but then, of course, we're talking about America's struggle to, or Texas's struggle to take land from Mexico. So, overall, you know, he had this American spirit, this this idea that, you know, this was part of America, and whatever, however you want to argue that, he felt that it was, you know, Texas, Texas' right to uh, have that land. And so when he was at the Alamo, uh, so many legends abound about the man. Uh, the all they can conclude about, in, in fact, it, it's it's still a mystery. Um, the only thing they can conclude about Davy Crockett's death is that he died at the Alamo. That's it. Uh, stories are um, so incredible, of course, that he just died in battle. Uh, second is that. Uh, he was one of the men who surrendered, and apparently Santa Ana came in, and he was so infuriated that his men took prisoners, because it was contrary to his order to take no prisoners, he had them instantly executed. Other reports say that he surrendered and was let go. Other reports say that he was sur uh, he surrendered, let go, only like to get him to turn his back to like walk away to, for him to be shot. Um, there are uh, there was a one of the uh, at the time an African American gentleman uh, who was uh, basically an indentured servant to Santa Ana claimed that uh, Crockett's body was found uh, dead amongst a pile of Mexicans, no less than sixteen. Uh, basically, you know, these guys surrounding him, and he's taken everybody out. They said they found his knife, you know, stuck in one of the Mexican guys' hearts. And uh, it took all these guys to take him down. And uh, another um, story is that uh, that later surfaced right around the height of the 1950s um, Walt Disney uh, cartoon, uh, the Pena Papers, which came out... Uh, which nobody has proven false and nobody has proven true either. Um, these are the sources of saying that Crockett either he surrendered, um, gave up, and was murdered. Uh, but then there is a, a woman who says as she was being led out of the Alamo, she laid eyes on him and his mutilated corpse uh, between the church and a barracks building. Uh, so that's really all that's known. Uh, they said they, Santa Ana had all of the bodies removed and uh, stacked out uh, in the field amongst wood, and he burned them. And it said it took so long to uh, remove all these bodies and whatnot. Really, the only thing they know for sure is that he died there. Uh, then, of course, there are the Elvis rumors, as uh, Jason Richards uh, alluded to earlier. Perhaps it was John. Oh, yeah. He never died at all. Uh, and perhaps just lived out his days somewhere else. Um, just fantastic. And, and as far as him being a Mason, what's interesting is uh, it's one of those things where we really don't have much proof. The only thing we have is that uh, his Masonic apron, which was made for him by a lady, Mrs. A.C. Massey of Washington, D.C., during his tenure in Congress... So uh, he sa it says, uh, before leaving for Texas, he entrusted the apron to the sheriff of Weekly County, Tennessee, and it was inherited and preserved by the sheriff's nephew, E.M. Taylor, at Paddock, Kentucky. 
The lodge uh, at Weekly County near Crockett Home burned during the Civil War, destroying all the lodge records. So it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, and it's actually by a guy named Pete Normand is where I pulled this from. Um, Pete Normand is uh, pretty big on... on writing about Freemasonry. Uh, pretty smart individual, so uh, he's from the Grand Lodge of Texas. But uh, that's basically Davy Crockett, and there's so much more to go into. I mean, dude was larger than life even during his lifetime. Uh, he honed all the skills of st storytelling and everything else while he was in the House of Representatives and, and a delegate. Um, but massive, massive persona. I can't hear you. All right. So uh, I'm going to take over for the slack of John's microphone. Uh, maybe we need to buy him a new one. But uh, I am <clears throat> going to go on and talk about William Barrett Travis, who was a contemporary of Jim Bowie in South Carolina. Um uh, sorry, contemporary of James Bonham in South Carolina. Uh, he was born in uh, Travis was born in South Carolina in 1809. Um, he uh, his family moved to Alabama when he was a child, and that's where he studied law and became an attorney and partner there, and operated for a brief time at uh, in Alabama as an attorney. He. Uh, He's the only one of these uh, members where I've been able to actually find his specific lodge. And uh, he actually joined masonry at Alabama Lodge Number 3, uh, which, is, which is really interesting. Um, he uh, he uh, was a militia man for most of his life. He accepted a position uh, in the 26th Regiment, 8th Brigade, 4th Division in the Alabama Militia. Interestingly enough, you know when you when you dig down into the lives of some of these Texans, they uh, they most certainly lived with passion. Um, he uh, he moved to Texas around 1831, but he left his wife, son, and unborn child in Alabama. Uh, the tradition has it that he suspected his wife had been unfaithful to him, and that his unborn child wasn't his. And reportedly, he actually killed a man over that uh, that belief. So it was very interesting to see how much he acted with passion. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, uh, he established a legal practice in Texas um, and became a part of another militia group that was eventually known as the War Party, which was uh, a formerly opposed to the law of April 6, 1830. Now, for those of you who um, don't ha haven't researched the, Al the, the Alamo or the, the Texas conflict very much, the, the law of April 6, 1830 was a major precursor to war because it was a law passed by Mexico um, that essentially made immigration to Texas from the rest of America and Europe illegal. So the war party was uh, was designed in part to oppose this law, um, and uh, Tra Brother Travis became more embroiled in in rising tensions between Mexico and Texas throughout the years of 1833 to 1835. As part of the war party, he later accepted a commission as a lieutenant colonel of the San Felipe Cavalry, and became the chief recruiting officer for the army. And this is where he actually uh, came into contact first with Jim Bowie. Um, and those two actually quarreled quite a bit over command. I believe Jim Bowie was a part of the Peace Party, whereas um, Brother Travis was a part of the War Party. And so they, they fought quite a bit uh, back and forth during this entire conflict. Um, they had an, an uneasy truce of a joint command until Bowie's illness um, forced him into into bed right before the uh, the Battle of the Alamo uh, killed them all. Mm. So um, Travis uh, actually, interestingly enough, um, was in charge of fortifying the Alamo. 
He uh, he was directed the preparation of the San Antonio de Valerio mission, also formerly known as the Alamo, um, for the anticipated arrival of Santa Ana. And so he was actually the person who uh, who directed all those fortifications for the Alamo to to get in place because they know they they knew they'd have to dig in there. Um, March 6, 1836, the Mexicans overpowered the Texans within a few hours, and uh, Brother Travis died early in the battle from a single bullet, a single bullet wound to the head. Um, tradition has it, as Robert was saying, that his body and the bodies of the other defenders were burned. And uh, you know, something interesting from the Grand Lodge of Texas page is that the nature of Travis's death elevated him from a mere commander of an obscure garrison to a genuine hero of Texas and American history. Um, so it's it's really interesting taking a look at that, all of these fierce, passionate Texans who were Masons and fighting for what they believed in, um, if a bit ham-handed in, in some aspects of their lives. Jason, uh, because you kind of had a little bit of a quote there, uh, which was really interesting, um, this, there was actually a an article that was written called The Last Days of Davy Crockett, which was in uh, April 2011 issue of American History Magazine. And uh, if I can, I just wanted to read this because I think it applies to all of these these guys at the Alamo. Um, it was basically saying that how America was having a really hard time processing the death of these guys, specifically Crockett. Um, New York newspapers ran uh, headlines that you know these guys weren't dead. And, of course, they were. Uh, and it says that that is one fact visible in the fog of their final days. The former congressman of Tennessee and uh, the others uh, were disposed of with gruesome anonymity. Uh, bodies dragged onto funeral pyres with those of other Alamo defenders. And for three days, the stench of burning flesh horrified the citizens of Bexar and brought in circling clouds of buzzards. It was with graceless. It was a graceless end, but the beginning of an uncontainable legend. Uh, it says, you know, these guys who had come to Texas in search of a new start had found immortality instead. And that's interesting because something we've seen from all of the gentlemen we've talked about so far is the fact that none of them were born and raised in Texas. Right. Almost yeah. all of them came from the East Coast, whether it be um, you know, South Carolina, Alabama, in some cases Kentucky, which isn't really the East Coast, but they all left their lives in search of something better. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you hear me now? No? Yes? Yes, all you're right. good. good. Good, good, good. All right, let's get into, I guess, the last one we have time for tonight, which is uh, a member of the opposition of the other side of the Battle of Alamo, which was Santa Ana himself. Santa Ana was the general and then president at the time uh, fighting for the Mexican side. His, uh, his full name is way too long, but uh, he did go by Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. And he was kind of known as the N Napoleon of the West. In fact, he had such a, a military complex that he did co collect items of Napoleon's uh, in his estate. He was a, a politician and a general, and he was really very active in the military, even from a young age. And so obviously he uh, did a lot to rise to that level uh, to, to lead these troops and then, of course, have the military prowess to win. But it does help to have a lot of guys fighting on your side. Masonically, which I find very interesting, is that uh, he also was a Mason, and that came uh, potentially, as rumor has it, to his benefit uh, shortly thereafter. Again, I said that the um, the Battle of San Jacinto uh, was on April 21st, 1836, just a couple weeks after uh, the success of the Mexican victory at the Battle of Alamo. And uh, Santa Ana was, was caught... And it has been said, let me see if I can find my notes here, that um, he was able to save himself from execution by giving secret Masonic signs when he was captured. And again, when he was brought before General Sam Houston. Remember, General Brother Sam Houston. 
Uh, other historians uh, record that he. I, I like the way that they capture this in the in the uh, in the, the book. That's um, Santa Anna filled the air with Masonic signs. I can just see this guy going all over the place trying to get attention of anybody who will who will see him. Uh, I let, filled the air with Masonic signs after his capture. Um, so fearing for his life gave a whole bunch of of things that other Masons may recognize. Uh, to try to get them to come to his aid. Um, also, as mentioned earlier, at the time, President Andrew Jackson, uh, a member of the same Masonic Lodge as Sam Houston, had written to Houston and implored him to save Santa Ana's life. Uh, remember that it would have been a good political and military tactic to not not um, to capture him alive, regardless. But again, you can. Um, maybe speculate that because he was also a, a brother that um, it could have come to his benefit as well. So it's it's a myth that has been told a couple times. Uh, it's not really been, been fully verified. What I find fascinating is just a couple of years ago that his Masonic credentials were verified. In fact, on April 9th of 2013, um, the Scottish Rite in San Antonio had a big press release that they had not only found his Scottish Rite dues card uh, that was legit uh, from Mexico, but they also found his apron. And so I'm going to show a picture of his apron here uh, that has been discovered. And apparently, uh, the article that I'll, I'll share in the show notes was really kind of an accidental find. Uh, but his credentials have been verified. He, he, he was a, a Mason in Mexico. And, you know, we've, we talk a lot about, um, we may, we've alluded to some things like with the Civil War and how um, that was brother fighting brother, both uh, literally and masonically. And in this war, you know, we have an example of that happening as well. So just fascinating story. It must have been amazing to be on opposite sides or, and, and to try to, to use the benefit of the fraternity uh, to potentially save your life. Speaking of saving lives, that dude needs to clean up. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's you, have incredible Masonic, you have this incredible Masonic thing and also <laughs> papers. This is yeah. an intervention. <laughs> 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 He's proud of it. Good for him. Yeah, for those listening, the picture that, that John showed is of a man holding a framed apron from uh, the Santa Ana, right? Yes. And, but his his place looks very cluttered. <laughs> Almost as bad as my bookshelf. <laughs> Almost. Almost. No, I'm looking at it now. That thing is cleaned up quite a bit. Yes, thank you. Thank Go back and watch like previous episodes and decide you need to do something about it. He's right. He's right. You know. Okay. <laughs> so one uh, one person that uh, we didn't get, one Mason at the Alamo that we didn't get a chance to talk about, uh, that I wanted to go over real quick was Almaron Dickinson, who was a captain at the Battle of the Alamo. He was actually uh, from Tennessee. Again, following that line of Masons who tried to to seek a better life in Texas, uh, he was trained actually as a blacksmith. Whereas, as we mentioned with the others, um, they were more learned. Uh, Brother Dickinson was was more of a, a blue collar uh, artisan and, and craftsman, and he survived until the the final battle or the final day of the battle at the Alamo, um, where he was uh, he was bayoneted to death and then burned with the others. Ouch. Yep. Not fun. So one thing before we get to the social media aspect, I did want to share a couple of pictures that I have. Back in 2009, I did go visit the Alamo. I was in San Antonio for a conference, and I have a couple of pictures I just wanted to share here. Uh, this is the Alamo as it looks in 2009. Um, what's interesting is the building that stands today is only a small fraction of what it used to be. In fact, uh, I think they have lines drawn out across the street, literally over the street, 
where the original uh, perimeter was. Uh, so what remains is probably less than a quarter of the original uh, church. And one thing that's that's very neat is that on again, if you're standing out front looking straight at the entrance to the, the sanctuary, if you look to the left, you'll see a little bit of a, a jut out, and you'll see two signs over here right on the corner. If you go check out those signs, you'll see that, wait for it, it's a Masonic plaque honoring those Masons we just talked about, and several of those unidentified Masons who gave their lives in the Battle of Alamo. So it's neat that it's it's on the corner. It was erected by the Grand Lodge of Texas in 1976. Um, there's another one, another older plaque that from 1948 that talks about the birthplace of Freemasonry in West, West Texas. Many of these pictures are available because they're out in the public. You can search Flickr or I'll share, share some of these. While I was there, I noticed a very interesting building, very ornate building. Not a not but a few blocks away, or maybe a block and a half away the from Crockett the Al Hotel Alamo itself. You'd think, well, yes, <laughs> you could see the sign for that in the first picture, but upon closer inspection, was the building for the Scottish Rite building for San Antonio, which is amazing. I, I literally stumbled upon it, and uh, brethren, if you are ever at the Alamo, take the time to walk the block and a half down and check out that beautiful, beautiful building that's standing there. Uh, so that's all I wanted to share was a couple of pictures uh, of the Alamo. And uh, there are Masonic events. We'll, we'll post a link to a public ceremony that was done by the uh, Masons in Texas last year at the anniversary of the Alamo that uh, extols all the virtues of the Masons who lost their life that day. With that, Jason, let's move right into social media. All right, so uh, Brother Chris Streeper uh, from Texas has been helping us out quite a bit with this episode uh, on social media, and uh, he, he affirms that the Alamo really is considered a sacred shrine, sacred shrine to, to Texans and is treated with a whole lot of dignity. Each year, the Grand Lodge of Texas holds one tiled meeting within the sanctuary of the Alamo, it's a really a beautiful um, occasion, and it includes a procession to the grounds and a commemoration. Um, and it's usually a highly attended event with standing room only. So uh, he says it's unlike any gathering of Masons he's ever attended. And to that I say, come to Pennsylvania on March 19th. <laughs> and the Alamo ceremony will still continue to, to be unlike any other event you've attended. Um, <clears throat> he also says that uh, there are quite a few interesting facts regarding Freemasonry in the Republic of Texas. Um, all of the presidents and vice presidents of the Republic of Texas were members of the craft, to include um, Interim President David G. Burnett, Interim VP Lorenzo de Zavala, uh, General Sam Houston, uh, and Vice President Mirabeau B. Lamar, uh, Second President Mirabeau B. Lamar, and uh, David G. Burnett, and uh, Anson Jones, and Kenneth Anderson, as well as Vice President Edward Burleson. So that's, uh, that's interesting. And these were presidents of the Republic of Texas, not presidents of the U.S. Uh, and finally, he, uh, he gave us a little insight into the last battle of the, the Texas conflict, which was the Battle of San... Yashinko, or Yasinto, excuse me, um, which is the, the last battle of the Texas Revolution, and it's where the battle cry, Remember Goliad, Remember the Alamo, originates. And that originated in a, uh, in a speech that General Sam Houston gave just prior to the final assault. San Jacinto. Thank you. Oh. I have trouble speaking Texan. <laughs> Texican. Texican, yes. And uh, that's really all we've got for, for social media tonight. 
All right, so instead of going around, this was a more of a historical episode, really not much to say uh, for final thoughts, but I'll let any of the guys jump in now if they have something that they, they can't contain. Juan, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I haven't known much about the Alamo. I've had some little encounters with the history of it here and there. So I really appreciated listening to all these uh, accounts of the men that were a part of this. Uh, one thing it's that the expression "Remember the Alamo" is deeply ingrained in 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 the American culture, and not knowing exactly what what it means, you kind of have an illusion to what 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 does it actually mean. But when you get to know a little bit more about the the individuals that fought there, the the the, the sheer numbers, the if you have the empathy to to think of the, the the terror that some you know these men had to live the last moments of his life, then it brings a, a sobering redefinition of what remembering the Alamo is. So I hope that the the brothers that are listening and watching have gotten a a, a new perspective as to the the real meaning of of that expression, and take the take the time to to think about it from. You know, from a patriotic perspective, from a historical perspective, and and even a Masonic perspective, what does it mean to remember the Alamo for you? If you think about it from each one of those perspectives, you know, we would love to hear uh, what you come up with. And if you can, please share it with us. Go to the events page on Facebook where the conversations are ongoing, or go to the MasonicRoundtable.com and leave your comments there. Uh, thank you as always for for listening and for sharing our programs with everybody. Uh, again, my name is Juan Sepulveda, the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry Podcast, and I encourage you to go to freemasonryart.com so you can see the latest paintings and drawings. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, Juan. Very nice uh, summary. Very, very touching. Thank you, brother. Anything, anyone else want to try and top that? <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> now, I'll just say thanks to everybody for continuing to listen and, and watch us week in and week out. Uh, we get to do a, a whole range of really cool stuff on this show and get to talk about masonry all around the world and we have a ton of fun doing it we hope that you have just as much fun listening to us uh, jabber on as we do about doing the jabbering so thanks so much like us on Facebook share us with your friends um, if you've got a brother or brethren or even um, other non-masons who are perhaps interested in masonry Share some of our episodes with them. Uh, we try very, very hard to be as objective as possible um, in everything we do on this show, and uh, we, we just love talking about masonry, so thanks so much for everything. Okay, well, let's start wrapping up then. Um, Juan said it best. Uh, remember the Alamo. Remember what it means to you, whether it be political, historical, or Masonic. Thank you very much for watching, and keep searching for more light. See you next week.